All right, what is going on, everybody? You are back here right now on episode two of Team Talk with Arrowhead Live. I'm going to be your host today. My name is Caleb James. Thanks again for coming back. Make sure you're liking and subscribing. I got a guest on the show today, my man, CJ Jones. CJ, for those of y'all who don't know him or unfamiliar with him, I've done some podcasts, done some work with him before in the past, but give everyone a little background on, you know, what you're here to provide for the show today. I am definitely a part of the Arrowhead Live team. Thank you for having me, Caleb. Caleb's my bro. Been knowing him for a couple of years now. Um, I am definitely one of the podcasters and one of the football analyst guys on the team. Uh, from Kansas City, born and raised here. Uh, went to high school at Bishop Yates in Olathe Northwest. And then I played my college ball at Coffeeville and then Alabama a &M. Yeah, man, it's kind of crazy. I remember CJ and I became acquainted here a couple of years ago during the pandemic when we were first kind of trying to start this whole Arrowhead Live thing up. You know, a lot of free time, but we both have a common interest in the Chiefs, a common interest, and, in, you know, that we've played some level of college football in the past and we just, you know, film rats. We love breaking it down, seeing who's doing what. Don't have any film for you guys tonight because Game Pass is uh, is no good right now, and I don't have a ton of college film that you guys probably haven't already all seen. But really, you know, it's kind of the dead time of the NFL. It's just kind of that, you know, it's rumor mill season. It's so just a lot of hanging out and waiting around. But, CJ, we did have an exciting offseason. You know, there was just so much drama with everything that was going on, mm -hmm. you know, with a lot of situations. It, I'm not going to bring up a whole bunch of it. But what what you're seeing with the Chiefs this year is so many new faces. There's so many new players. They know they bring in all these draft picks. They've got several free agents. And a lot of these guys are going to be tasked with starting right away and you know maybe those are immense expectations for you know first year guys out of college and maybe we you know that's gonna be high expectations for the guys they brought in in free agency you know they got big shoes to fill but who is one guy you know who's new to the team or maybe didn't play a lot last year who you're most excited to take a look at you know as we get into training camp the preseason and youth kind of you know you're gonna be excited to watch them all season and see how they progress with the team Absolutely. There's a lot of new faces and you could go down the list of every positional group on both sides of the ball that got a new player in there, which I'm very excited about. I love that we got younger and we got some new faces in there to move forward for the future. But as far as like my top three guys, I would say I'm most excited to see definitely Sky Moore. I'm excited to see what he does in his offense, playing Z, playing the slot, putting him in motion, seeing him get off the line. I love how he attacks the ball. So I'm definitely excited to see how he meshes with Trav and Juju and Nicole and MVS and Pat for sure. Um, then after him, I would probably say Leo Chanel. That's probably one of my favorite guys. I'm excited to see how they're going to use him. Um, obviously, we want to see how our pass rush room grows, but I love his physicality and the way that they blitzed him a lot of Wisconsin. So I'm excited to see him in his group as well. And after that, I would probably say it, it, it's hard. It's a hard choice. But after that, I'd probably say Trent McDuffie. Trent McDuffie's a guy. I think we've been all been looking for our next corner outside of Sneed since we had guys like Marcus Peters in the building. So I think he's going to be a starter here for a long time. I know a lot of people had him ranked high. At like their number three or two corner, depending on who you were talking to. So those are probably my top three guys I'm most excited to see. I saw a stat from McDuffie that he played something like the second most snaps of press man coverage of any yep. cornerback in college football. I think uh yep. Pritt, was it I think it was Pritchard or from uh Auburn played like a few more than him. But that exactly. just you know, he's it's showing you he's a good guy Spags wants it. I don't think there's gonna be any secret what they want to do with him. And mind you, with McDuffie, they traded up to get him. Veach has exactly, a, and he's a cornerback. And Veach is, you know, he's he's been, you know, been able to hit on late round draft picks like Legarius and Fenton, and then kind of had, you know, Charvarius was just kind of a guy he just brought in and they develop along. You know, he's never really been able to invest in that position, so I think that's why there's optimism for McDuffie there. Mm -hmm, exactly, they're definitely high on him as well. And if you watch Washington, they've had a lot of DBs come to the league and play well in transition. I know some of the big names like Buda Baker, but they've had a lot of other DBs that have came into the league and played really well. So I'm excited to see what he does. Oh, yeah. For me, my top three for the new guys, I, I'm going to go a little bit different. This guy was on the roster last year, but he didn't really play a ton. And I'm going to go with Malik Herring on this one because I think he kind of fits what Spags is kind of want to try to do. I think he's going to be a good situational player. But if you watch his film at Georgia, you know, his stats don't pop off, but his effort in his on the film does. I think he's going to find some sort of a way to make this roster. 
And, you know, this is a team that's desperately needing defensive end help. So I think they'll be able to kind of use him. Um, I'm going to go with Leo Chanel also, just because I'm excited. Leo. To see. I think, I think if, you know, if you're going to come out and you're, introduction to the chiefs at the training camp would be talking about you're here to bring violence and physicality well we're expecting it from you now and we want to see it oh man his film is super fun to watch because from one end of the spectrum you know people go like well he's just going to be a strong side linebacker but you see the different ways they align him and i'm like Mm -hmm. well bags doesn't just play guys at one spot he moves people around all the time to get into a situation to where they're at the best and, you know, with the, and at the very minimum, I think he's going to be an upgrade. Him, you know, in there with Nick and Willie, that's going to be an upgrade over what we saw. Absolutely. The <laughs> at the very least, because he can tackle and wrap up at a consistent level. And I think he's right. even the body type to where he's going to can bring some consistent pass rush. And then my other guy, he's a free agent. I'm going to go with MVS. I went to that training camp. I went to the mini okay. camp here a little bit. You know, you're hearing about like him and Mahomes having this chemistry, having, you know, this kind of rapport they kind of seen. Well, he's caught passes from a guy who's very similar to Patrick Mahomes his entire career. So he's used to a quarterback that can make the impossible throw, can hit the impossible, you know, he can hit the impossible angle, put it on a dot, you know, and Aaron Rodgers. They look like they had chemistry, but I know, you know, I got a lot of friends who are Packers fans. I chat with some of them. They're like, oh, he's just a deep ball threat. But you go, you know, you go back and take a look at when he's not just running the deep balls. He really has, you know, this last season in particular, he has a great way of adjusting his body midair. And he's got a big catch radius. I mean, he's a tall dude. He's one of those guys. He just kind of feels like he kept just a little bit more. He's going to be really good. But I've loved the way he controls his body in the air. I think he's going to provide some problems with his speed and kind of with some of that vertical pass catching ability absolutely absolutely but i think it was interesting we both named some players who are going to be possible pass rushers possible guys like that and that's just because right now the chiefs are a little they're thin along the defensive line they didn't bring back melvin i wasn't happy about that i know unfortunately (laughs) I, i know and i know people i know the whole like well his stats really weren't that great he did make some kind of an impact though and he looked like you know if he spent a little more time with the team he'd probably have a good idea, you know, or even if they could have just used him more situationally, he probably could have provided even more juice. You know, they got Carl Loftus, you know, they make it, they bring back Derek Naughty to play nose tackle. They're losing Jerron Reed, but maybe Colin Saunders steps up. Defensive end though, I mean, they're thin there because right now on the roster, they got sure. Frank Clark, George Carl Loftus, and they're going to be asking a lot from Carl Loftus early on is what it sounds like. They got Mike Dana, Kando, and probably Malik Herring or Tershawn Wharton in a pinch. And that kind of brings me to my next topic, because there's been a lot of rumors, a lot of chatter about Robert Quinn potentially being on the trade block. Where would you where would you be on this kind of a move? I actually love this move. I know I think me and you probably talked about this before the draft. I didn't know if Chicago was actually going to make a move on him because I was actually screaming for him to get moved in the offseason during free agency. I wanted to go after him. But obviously there were other guys we were trying to get after at the time, like Chandler Jones was on the market. A lot of people wanted him. And obviously we all wanted Stephon Gilmore as well. But I know Beach kind of pivoted and didn't sign the guys because they all got big deals where they went. So Robert Quinn's coming off a major season, 18 and a half sacks last year in a Chicago team where they were down almost like 70 or 80% of the time in their games, like always behind. So a guy like that who obviously he's been an all pro, he's been a pro bowler before. This would be his fifth team. I know he's played in Dallas, Chicago, Miami and St. Louis. So he's played across really good defensive ends like Chris Long, or he's played on teams where he's been the number one defensive event as well. So uh, Robert Quinn is still not, he's not, he's not the youngest guy on the team. I think he's about to be 34 this year, I believe. So I know he's at the 32, 32. So he's at the close to the end of his career, but coming off a season where you get almost 20 sacks in a Chicago team where they weren't winning a lot of games and they were really always behind. And now he gets to play with a team where they're going to be winning more games and playing with a lead playing in Arrowhead. We know how pass rushers love that, that crowd noise. So to get his lineman jumping off sides, I think Robert Quinn would be very big with this offense. And we need that veteran leadership and guys to set the tone. And I think, like you said, that'll make George Carl his job that much easier so he doesn't have to shoulder that, that much that load. And Frank Clark as well. And Mike Dana and all the other guys as well. And Chris Jones would help him. And, and Chris, sack nation, baby. Here's the th- Man, this is such a weird – he had the 18 and a half sacks. But before that, the season before, he has two. 
the season before, you know, he's been like for his entire career, he's like because he's probably consistent seven to eight sack season kind of guy. Exactly. Good, but not great. He's had a couple of outlier seasons where he put up, you know, I think he put up 10 or 11 sacks, but then he just explodes out of nowhere last season. At 31 years old. Like, 31 whoa. years old. That's really rare. And really, I mean, the Bears are in a position where new head coach, new general manager, it's probably in their best interest to try to move him and free up some cash exactly. because they got to get Justin Fields some help. They They're a young get, team. They got to get him an offensive line. They got to get him some receivers. They got to get him some guys that know how to play football. They got to get him Facts. Help. Facts. <laughs> just taking a look at, you know, Robert Quinn's cap is going to be, you know, his cap number for the next couple of seasons is going to be in the 17 to 18 range. That's a lot of money, you know, you and then you look at it this year, they can, you know, if they cut him, they'd save, you know, they would save four million, but it's twelve million in cap space. So they're really not. This isn't a situation where I think they're going to cut yeah. him unless they're just they they will, they will, yeah. and they really want to get him off the books. And I think he has too much trade value. Mm-hmm. The only thing that's interesting about this is, as you mentioned, that age, because nobody wants to get stuck with a guy who's going to be thirty-two, and let's say he gets hurt and has to miss time. Well, then you've got exactly you know, quite a bit of money locked up in him Mm -hmm. and you start to go, well, we got to pay Chris Jones this also. And then Kelsey, it's going to kind of, that's what it's going to come down to whichever team, you know, does end up trying to pick him up. If the bears even trade him in the first place, you know, player wise scheme wise, I think he's a great fit for what the chiefs want to do. I know Spags would certainly use him. The chiefs probably wouldn't even use him every down. They probably just designate him to pass rush downs or maybe, you know, third downs situations like that is kind of what I'd be hoping for. I'd be happy with that too, to be honest. I don't I just kind of I'm I'm wondering what kind of compensation it would take to get him. Like, are we looking yeah, at Yeah, I know. Like I think they said it would come down like what eight mil and twelve in dead cap for the next two years. That's, yeah, that's what the dead cap is. So it's not terrible, but it's not great either. So and then pick pick compensation also, though. Something also to take it. Yeah, the pick compensation. So like if we look at the theme Veach has been on, like Chandler Jones around the same age, correct? So he he didn't really make that move. Melvin Ingram, I think, is older than those guys, if I'm not mistaken. I think he's like 33. By about a year. 34. Yeah, about a year. So we we obviously we put in, obviously we put our inquiries in for going for guys like Chandler and Melvin, and we didn't necessarily didn't win them. So it wouldn't shock me if we didn't be aggressive trying to go get Robert Quinn. But like you said, the move and the fit makes ultimate sense. Now it's just gotta look at the money and the numbers and does Beach want to pull the trigger? And the trend for the offseason has been he kind of leaned it away from the veteran guys. But I think we all could agree this time of year, you can't really be too picky on your on your players that are available because season's about to start, free agency's done, draft is done. Now we're just waiting for training camp to start. So you need to have more better. And you can never have enough pass rushers. Me and you have been saying that for years. So um, getting Robert Quinn in the building would make everyone's job in the D-line room a lot easier. I think it would make a lot of Chiefs fans a lot more comfortable about our D-line room. So I would love for the move to happen. But, yeah, the money definitely is going to be a factor in the decision for sure. That – I mean, if they did, they if they did make that move, it would have. I think they'd have to really watch his load management because you want that oh, guy. Absolutely, you want that. You don't want to burn that guy out ten games in. Facts. You know, you want him like we had Melvin. Because here is the one thing I will say about Melvin: when he came in and provided juice, you know, it was late in the season. You know, some of those guys get older; they start to lose their juice down the stretch of the season. And I even think we saw some of that with Chris Jones this year. I think just from having to carry so much of the load on the defensive line. I think he just ran out of gas as the season yeah. went along. He's just getting right. banged up. He was getting beat up. This would help everybody out. Going to be interesting to see. Just based on what Vish has done, I would almost say that, you know, I think that the money and the age would probably be enough to scare him away. I think he wants to keep mm-hmm. that cap flexibility. But the reason I think he wants to do that also, and we transition into the next topic here, is because there's a lot of stuff going on right now with Orlando Brown and his contract. You know, we're getting OBJ. close. We're getting close. You know, I'm looking at the date today. It's the seventh. You know, we have they have until the fifteenth. They have tomorrow. 15th, yeah, July they 15th. have a week. They have a week from tomorrow to get this deal done or to figure out what they're going to do. Is he going to just sign the tag? Or is something unexpected about to happen? What are your thoughts mm-hmm. on that right now? I feel like it's kind of right on schedule, right? Like every year, it always happens. Like right whenever the deadline is, GMs and players and agents always wait till the last minute to get anything done. But anytime there's like a contract extension, a trade, 
you want to cut a player. They always wait to the last minute because you want to exhaust all your options as an agent or as a GM. You want to look at all every possibility. What can we do? And we all know Orlando signed a brand new agent this offseason. I think this is his first time being a, a, a agent as well. So um, he signed a new agency. First time Orlando was trying to negotiate a big time contract at left tackle because previously he played right tackle in Baltimore. So we all know the market for those two positions are drastically different. So um, obviously, like I love Orlando. I want him. I want him here. Um, when he came out and said he wants to be the highest paid tackle in the league, that kind of probably scared a lot of people. He's definitely a top 10 tackle, in my opinion. Where you want to rank him is kind of debatable. You can kind of shuffle guys and some names around. But I definitely think he's one of the better young tackles in the league. And he's only 25. About to be about to be 26. So he's a, he's a young guy. He's in his prime. Um, I, I wouldn't put him in the top five as far as tackling the league, but I wouldn't put him, like, in the bottom of the league either. I think he's, like, right where, like we just said, around top 10-ish. I think that's a good range for him. So. I want him here, but we obviously got to figure out the numbers. And also you have to think about if you don't resign him, what are the options in next year's class for tackles? We have 12 picks as of now before we make any decisions with trades and anything. So if there's a tackle we really do love in the next class, I would understand that if they decided to tackle Orlando. But if there's not a tackle that you love in the next class, especially when you have Patrick Holmes in his prime, you have to think about these things. Is that rookie going to come in and play right away good football against the defensive lines in the AFC West who have all, let's be honest, Caleb, they got better. So yeah. how, how much of a loss would it be if we didn't have Orlando when we put in a rookie next year? So at the moment right now, I would say sign Orlando to a long-term deal. That would be my decision, but we definitely have to figure out the, the semantics and the money about it for sure. I have so many different thoughts about this, and I hear so much about it because it's all they talk about is people are people like, does he deserve this money? Does he not? <laughs> so much talk and conversation? Because it is, I mean, it's it's been the last couple of weeks, it's been the major talking point across Chiefs. Yeah, it's, all, it's the only you thing know, we're worried I'm, about now. I'm an offensive yeah. line guy. I'm always going to break it down. Is he a top three left tackle in the NFL? No, he's not a top three no. left tackle. I don't think he's, you know, he's not Trent. He's not Teron Armstead. He's not Ronnie Stanley. No healthy that's what you know that's my Patiari, all those guys yeah Patiari, <laughs> yeah tyron smith when he's healthy he's not one of those guys could he be or could he develop into a level of a guy like that yeah because he is still so young and he's been in the league a while for being a young guy my yeah. thing is this is not a position to mess around with you know people are like, oh, Facts. we can let him go and shuffle the line and i'm like this is not a uh... that was not a position that you want to be, you know, hedging and like just, oh, we're just going to throw depth at it. You know, you can do that with a exactly. lot of people on the offensive line. They're doing it with right tackle right now. You know, they got Kennard, they got Wiley, they got Lucas back from injury. Mm-hmm. They're going to they're gonna let three guys go into camp and compete for that spot, and they're going to find a guy who really can play. That's not what you want to do with left tackle, though. And Absolutely. My other big thing with that is I know people are going, well, Fisher was mid, you know, mid-level tackle. They didn't pay him the most money in the world, so why should we pay Orlando that? You got to remember though, with Eric Fisher, and this is really important. Something also, he has played. He played in Kansas City for you know nine seasons. He had that entire career. He knew he knew the offense in and out. He knew the chemistry he had with Andy Reid, and he developed great chemistry with Patrick Mahomes. Okay, you don't want to be throwing Pat a different left tackle every year because let's Pat. You know when Pat drops and rolls out, you know he gets he gets a little crazy sometimes his tackles got to kind of know those tendencies too. And he's got to know his mm-hmm. tackles tendencies. Like, you know, exactly. Pat knows like Pat, you know, Pat starts throwing the ball a little quicker because he knows Orlando likes to jump set. So let me help him out a little bit. Or Orlando knows maybe I got to kick a set, you know, maybe take a little bit of a wider set here because Pat, mm-hmm. you need to buy Pat some time is third and long. He might get out and run, you know, this isn't something that just your average run of the mill guy can do. And to be honest mm-hmm. with you, I've seen, I've heard so much about this all offseason. People go, oh, the, the Chiefs have all the leverage over Orlando. Who on the roster is going to play left tackle if they don't get a deal done right now? Exactly. <laughs> what's the, what's I mean, the next best option? That's been my big thing is, I mean, you're looking at maybe moving Joe Tooney out to the left tackle or, you know, putting someone at left tackle who shouldn't be at left tackle. Exactly. It's, it's not a position you want to mess around with. And really, if I'm the Chiefs, honestly – the best ideal situation for both sides, I think, would be for him to play on the franchise tag and make him almost prove it a little bit. But then, you know, you get you run into a situation where if he over exceeds expectations, then yeah, you're exactly pay him like you're gonna have to pay him Trent Williams money. But mm-hmm. really, I do think they're gonna get a deal done. I think, you know, if they were gonna go after another left tackle or something like that, I think that maybe they would have addressed some of it this offseason. 
that and when you're drafting 26 to 31, it's so hard to get into that elite tackle range because the elite tackles are going exactly, to especially now exactly. so more than ever. I mean, maybe they'd have a shot. It's so like Zion Johnson from Miami next season late, but because they're saying right now he's going to be like a 30, a third, you know, a late 30 draft pick. But I'm like, well, we all know once the draft comes around, he does his workout and everything, he's going to jump into the top 10, exactly. especially after he plays the season. You can't project long term like that. So I think they're going to get a deal done with him here within the next week or so. I bet you it'll be like Wednesday. It'll be like Wednesday night next week they get the deal done. Yeah, for sure. And the deal may honestly already be done. They're just probably working on some magic as far as like when do we want to announce it? How do you want to sign? When are you going to be in town? You know they got to come in do the photo photo op and all that Roster stuff. Bonuses. Roster, Roster, yeah, Roster, Roster bonuses. Yeah, bonuses. Exactly. And like all the rookies are signed, right? Right? They got to get all that money figured out. All the rookies are signed. Yeah, I believe all yeah, the rookies so. are signed. They should have. I believe everyone. they're all signed too. They should have everyone you know ready to go. It's gonna mm-hmm. be a it's gonna be a fun next couple of weeks. I can't wait to get up to training. I know, bro. I know. I know for everyone listening, I know CJ and I were going to try to get up to training camp as much as possible. Yes, it's hard, you know, living an hour away from St. Joe and getting up there and we're trying to go up there because they practice on some work days and everything, so we can't always get off. <laughs> but I'm I'm looking forward to getting up there. I want to see the competition. It's going to be good across the board. This is a team that's brought in a lot of guys who are unproven, and I really think that's the one thing they're going to, you know, hold their hat on this season is that they do have this unproven bunch of guys, you know, Juju and MVS, they come, they're coming from places. They're like, you guys were good, but you got, are you really that good? Or, you know, are you mm-hmm. just because you're playing with Aaron Rodgers? Are you just good? Cause you know, maybe cause you're playing with big Ben. I don't know if anybody thinks that. Oh God. <laughs> I don't know if anybody thinks that, but yeah, it's, it's going to be fun. You got any, you got any closing thoughts, my man? Uh, no, man, you said it all, man. I'm excited for the season, excited for training camp. I expect this defense to be very fast, hungry, physical. Shout out to Leo. Um, I would I would give Chiefs fans this big advice. Temper expectations for the first four games of the year, like the first month, because we know that's going to be a transitional period, a lot of new faces, a lot of new guys in different positions. I believe the, I believe the, the system and everybody's going to mesh together. I just – like you like you know this, Caleb. Everything takes time. Football isn't the kind of sport you can just – throw guys out there and say, hey, make it work. It takes time to gel together. So, and especially we have what our first, we have like our first three games in 14 days. We open up with Arizona, LA, Chargers. and then we, um, yeah, then the Chargers. So yeah, if we have like our first three games and like, like, I don't know, so that'd be two games, yeah, three, three games in 14 days in the first two weeks. So I think it's just going to tell guys just to just temper expectations and just come in with a clear mind, clear head. I believe we will live up to the hype. I just think it may take a little time. And Thankfully, we have 17 games to do so. So <laughs> I'm excited for the year, man. I'm excited. No, early on, early on, they're going to be relying on the offensive line, the backs, Kelsey and Pat all game. They're going to be relying a lot. on yeah. it. On. And our schedule is nasty the first six games, bro. It's so crazy. It's a long season, though. This is going to be one of those seasons where even if after the first six, you're three and three, you're like, all right, we still have a shot. To all get right. It. Our guys are still getting better every week. That's exactly. the one thing the Chiefs have, you know, these guys, you know, these other teams got all the established veterans, but we got these guys that are going to keep developing and making strides throughout the season. So that'll be fun exactly. to watch. All right, everybody, make sure to go follow me and CJ on Twitter. You can follow me at CJ Scoobs. You can follow me at CGZ81. Yeah, and make sure to like and subscribe to this video and the YouTube channel. And make sure to go follow at Arrowhead Live with all of the great content we're going to be pumping out for you guys this season. Hopefully going to be doing a little bit of live reporting up at camp here in a little bit. But all right, everybody, CJ, thanks for coming on, man. And as always, everybody, keep on keeping on.